For years now, one of our national pastimes has been agonising over the accepted wisdom that first home buyers are shut out of the property market. Um, but according to our next guest, Boy, oh boy, Ashley Church, that's simply a myth. Joining us now from Wellington is One Roof Property Commentator, Ashley Church. Hey, uh, John. How are you, Ashley? Normally you're with us in the Auckland studio, but Hayley's telling me you're actually Wellington-based. Uh, b- b- half and half, but yeah, sometimes down here, sometimes up there. Always good to be with you guys. Though. Yeah, yeah, we're delighted to have you with us. Look, I'm just looking at the demographer, d- d- demographia, international housing affordability. Says housing affordability using median multiple. Uh, housing is severely unaffordable in New Zealand relative to household income, right? As a multiple of household income. So yeah. this is measurable. Why do you think that's not the case? Well, it's not so much that it's not the case. And t- that's measuring what houses actually cost relative to, to incomes. And I think that's probably a, a reasonable statement. because And that figure's been getting further and further away from incomes over the last 40 years. So that's that's valid. What I'm talking about is the ability to actually buy a house with the resources that are available. And John, this came about actually as a result of having a chat to you last week. I wrote an, went away wrote an article based on that conversation about first home buyers. And so you remember that uh, we talked about the fact that Velocity about a year ago came out with a report uh, that said that first home buyers for the last five or six years now had actually been uh, the biggest buyers of property in the market, which exploded a whole lot of myths which had been in the market prior to that, which were the first home buyers had been closed out of the market. And to the extent that there was a, a perception that they had been, it was based around uh, a, a number of assumptions. One of them was that uh, foreign buyers had had an impact on and were closing them out of the market. Another one was that uh, property investors were closing them out of the market. Another one was, as you say, that it was around affordability. But the big one, and the one that I've always felt was the big obstacle was the deposit. So you remember that the Reserve Bank brought in the uh, loan-to-value ratio restrictions a few years ago, 20% deposit to buy a house. I've always been of the view that in more expensive cities, particularly Auckland, that that was the major obstacle to people actually getting into the market. The LVRs. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I think that's a statement of fact. Um, in part, uh, that was the intention of the LVRs, not to shut first home buyers out, but just no. to make sure people had equity uh, b- b- because the market needed cooling, right? Yeah, it did. And and uh, although there are some of us who would argue that it goes through a cycle in which it was going, a case it was going to cool cool regardless of anything that the government may or may not have done, and in fact that's proven to be the case pretty much on track. But what it does do is it really addresses this. So, so we know now that first home buyers are actually in the market and they are buying, but that shouldn't stop. Us. We shouldn't say job done and move on. We should still be looking at to see whether there are other things that we can do. And John, my argument now, what I want to talk to you today is is, is that uh, while first home buyers are in the market pretty strongly, there is some misconceptions or some misunderstandings about things that are available to them. And there are other people who probably feel that they are closed out of the market who could still get into it if they use some of these uh, tools. Okay, I just I just want to come back though to the to, to, to the ratio of household sure. income to the cost of housing. So in 2004 it was 5.9. So let's say yeah. six. Now it's nine. Nine point. 9.2. So, yeah. so it's so six to 9.2 is an increase of 50 percent, right? So, yeah. is so you, you're not disputing that. So, not at all. So, so, so what is so? How do people with low household incomes, given the deposit that is required in our major cities, so Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch in particular, how the hell do they get in, Ashley? So a number of ways, and just the one comment I would make before I get onto these in regards to the comment you just made is that the thing that's changed is that interest rates have come down quite dramatically over the last 20 years. So to the extent that house prices have come up, the cost of borrowing that money has come down. So it's kind of compensated for that increase. But you're right. But the things that they can do, there's a few things that they can do that I think that perhaps some first home buyers don't know about. The first thing most people will be aware of is they can use their KiwiSaver. So they can, if, if they're in KiwiSaver, for every year that they've been in KiwiSaver, they can get a grant of up to 1000 bucks to a maximum of 5 thousand. Um, if they're buying a new home, they can double that to 2000 a year to a maximum of 10000 um, The second one, John, is something called the Home Start uh, Grant, uh, which is about uh, giving them some additional funding which they can apply for um, based on, the again, the time that they've been in KiwiSaver. But the third one, and this is the one I think is not understood at all, there's a thing called the Welcome Home Program. Um, it's a program that was introduced this number of years ago. In fact, in Australia, they're about to introduce a copy of it based mm, on what we've yeah, done here are. in New Zealand. Um, it's only available through, uh, in terms of the major banks, it's only available through Westpac, but it's available through Kiwi Bank and some of the smaller banks. And what that does is it says that if you qualify for that program, and there are some income limits, uh, you can't earn over 85000 if you're single or 130000 if you're a couple. Household, yeah. Yeah, but if you qualify for that, you can actually buy 
buy a home with a 10% deposit rather than a 20% deposit. And that's a massive difference in some of our largest cities. It's, it's literally half of what you're otherwise paying. And normally that would be worrying because of your mortgage, but with interest yeah. rates at all time lows, Correct. for the time being, you think that's a risk worth taking? Oh, I do think it's a risk worth taking. And in fact, that brings me to my next point, um, which is uh, the bank of mum and dad. So people are aware of this concept. We talk about the bank of mum and dad. The bank of mum and dad is basically using equity in mum and dad's home to make up the difference in either a 10 or a 20% deposit. And, 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 and there will be people who are able to do that. But yes. of course, we're seeing generational pol- poverty in this country and we're seeing generational exclusion. So if mum and dad are renters, that's not helpful at all, is it? No, it's not. But in this case, if mum and dad own a property, the bank, the bank of mum and dad thing works in one of two ways. It can either be mum and dad borrowing money against their own house and giving it to you for, as, as, as an advance towards your deposit. Um, but I think what happens in most cases, and this comes back to your question about how much you borrow, is people will actually borrow. So what happens with the bank of mum and dad? You get, the, the bank will lend you up to 80 or even 90%, depending on whether you're buying existing or new. They'll use the equity in your mum and dad's home as security for the difference, which effectively allows you to borrow 100% of the value of the property. So it's worth understanding it's not mum and dad in that case giving you money. It's simply the bank saying, we recognise there's some more security over here, so we'll allow you to borrow the whole amount. Now, if you believe in capital growth and in property cycles, that shouldn't be particularly scary because you know that that property is going to increase in value over time. If you don't, of course, then you're right. It would be very scary. Ashley Church, Ashley does his writing for oneroof.co.nz. We really appreciate you joining us every uh, week. Ashley, you're a fantastic commentator and uh, throwing the cat amongst the pigeons a little bit this morning. We're very grateful. Thanks, uh, John. Thank you for your encouragement, Ashley Church.